So let's talk about examination of the knee. Uh, we'll start with a basic run through and then we'll go into some of the finer points uh, later. So the first thing you need to do is expose your patient um, and while they're doing that uh, you can wash your hands and uh, just uh, look at how freely they're moving. Do they seem to be in pain? Do they have a walking stick? Um, in an exam you'll be presented with a patient in shorts and, and that's probably fine um, but ideally they ought to be down to their underwear. So the first thing we need to do is inspection. So looking from the front uh, we can notice that there's no obvious wasting of his quadriceps, there's no obvious scars around the front of his knee, um, including small arthroscopy scars. His knee is well aligned uh, with a normal femoral tibial angle and there's no obvious swelling. Uh, can you turn the face that way, sir? And looking from the side, again, no scars. The knee appears to be in, in full extension, even a few degrees of hyperextension. Um, no wasting of his calf or, or hamstring. And again, he's, he's well balanced. His foot is flat on the floor. And face away for us. And looking from behind, no scars in the popliteal fossa. No obvious swelling suggestive of a Baker cyst. Um, normal alignment of the uh, hind foot. And again, no obvious wasting. And just turn and face me. And quickly, just looking on the inside, again, there's no obvious scars. OK. Um, a good screening test for the knee is just to get the patient to do a deep squat. So can you just squat down and come back up? And that's a very rough screening test of his patellofemoral function. Next, we'd like you to go for a walk now. So looking at his uh, gait, again looking for the symmetry of gait, normal stance and swing phase. With respect to the knee, I want to know particularly is it antalgic? Is he walking with a stiff knee? Has he got a drop foot? Which may suggest previous perineal nerve injury. And that's all normal. So, uh, examine the patient now on the couch. Again, ideally, lie the patient down completely flat. And uh, want to just complete our in inspection. Um, make sure both legs are fully exposed. Uh, looking again for wasting of the quadriceps. Have a really good close look now for any uh, scars. Uh, little arthroscopy scars can be difficult to see. Um, there's no obvious swelling there. And no obvious colour changes. And now we'll move on to uh, palpation. Quick feel of the temperature. It's normal for the temperature to get a little bit cooler as you go down the leg. And there's no increased warmth. Uh, now we want to check for a, an effusion. The various ways of doing that. To look for a small effusion, we can do the uh, bulge test or the wipe test. And what we do there is we milk the fluid out of the medial gutter across the suprapatella pouch and then milk down the lateral side, watching for a bulge on the medial side. And there's no effusion there. We can do patella tap, which will pick up a moderate effusion, press the suprapatella pouch, and try and blot the patella against uh, the femur. Uh, now we want to go on and uh, check for any areas of tenderness. And that's uh, best done in uh, flexion. So just bend your knee to about a right angle there, and then uh, palpation is really done with one or two fingers only and remember the knees are subcutaneous joints so you really can identify individual structures and you've got to be thinking of surface anatomy. So we feel the patella tube, the, the, the tibial tubercle, patella tendon, looking at the patient's face, inferior polar patella, medial patella margin, superior polar patella, lateral patella margin, along the medial joint line, origin of the MCL, insertion of the MCL, and on the lateral side, the lateral joint margin, origin of, MC, of LCL, insertion of LCL, fibula head, and then palpate, lateral hamstrings, medial hamstrings, and then deep in a popliteal fossa. So there's no areas of obvious tenderness there. The next thing we need to do now is the range of movement. Firstly, just noting as he's lying on the bed, the uh, knee appears to be in full extension. You can quickly lift the feet and look for any asymmetry. Doesn't seem to be any asymmetry. And we can formally measure the hyperextension by fixing his uh, thigh with, his, with one hand. And he hyperextends by about five centimetres. And on the other side, again, his heel comes about five centimetres away from the couch. Now, can you bend your knee for me? So if we start with active movements, 
and that's about 150 degrees and passively not much more so he's got a full range of flexion of the knee next thing we need to do now is check the ligaments so the way we do that is we flex the knee to 90 degrees flex that one to 90 degrees and you've got to compare the two so you put them next to each other we're going to look from the side and we're looking to see if the tibial tubercle has sagged back relative to the opposite side which would indicate a posterior sag suggestive of PCL injury now we're going to check uh, the anterior draw so we'll pop that leg down first thing we need to check is hamstrings are relaxed so just try and relax those for me and then we are going to simply try and subluxe the tibia forwards just relax those it's tensing and that's a negative anterior draw and we can compare with the other side and then we can do a posterior draw looking for posterior subluxation of the tibia then we can move on and we can do uh, Lachman's test which is a specific test for ACL injury uh, it's going to be quite a difficult test to do with somebody with a large uh, leg essentially what you're trying to do is grab grasp the distal end of the femur with one hand allow the tibia to fall backwards and then try and sublux it forwards and he has a negative Lachman's test an alternative way of doing it is to place the thigh over the knee stabilize the femur that way and then do this same maneuver and that's particularly good if you've got small hands or somebody with a large leg and again we can compare with the other side um, additional tests we, and then we need to move on and do the uh, collaterals so we can check the medial collateral ligament in 30 degrees of flexion and then in full extension we're testing the posteromedial capsule and then the lateral collateral with a firm end point at 30 degrees and then in full extension testing the posterolateral capsule uh, optional tests that we can do now we can do the pivot shift test various ways of doing that um, and we'll talk more about that in the next part of the uh, video but pivot shift test to look for an ACL injury and you can also do McMurray's test which involves flexing the knee fully palpating the medial joint line and externally rotating while extending and then the same palpating the lateral side and internally rotating watching the patient for pain and feeling for any clicks quick screening examination of the hip because it's quite common for patients with hip arthritis to have knee pain so he's got good internal rotation not in any obvious pain from his hip and then finally we just want to finish with the neurovascular examination so thinking of the knee we're thinking of the nerves around the knee specifically the perineal nerve so sensation you feel that sir yes same both sides yes so dorsum of the foot sensation and bend your toes backwards pull up hard against me and he's got normal power in his perineal nerve then the tibial nerve running down the back of the knee so that's sensation on the sole of the foot same both sides yes and push down with your toes push down hard okay and that's normal power and then once again we check the pulses tibial artery and dorsalis pedis So that's the basic examination of the knee uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, Mr Pete Thompson who's one of our knee consultants here. Um, so Pete, can you just take us through some of the abnormal gaits that you can see in patients with knee pathology? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to get John now to stand up. There's a couple of things I thought would be worth highlighting. Um, first of all, uh, the gait abnormality that we call a varus or valgus thrust. Now it's slightly difficult to demonstrate when you haven't got the problem but we're going to get John to try that. We're going to start in the corner here and get you to walk towards the camera. Now. If you have a varus thrust, when you put your weight on the knee, you need to walk back again, it collapses into more varus alignment. And we see this in two problems. Firstly, in patients who've got loss of medial joint space due to medial compartment degenerative changes. And secondly, that's great, John, we'll get you to stop there. And secondly, patients um, who have laxity of the ligaments on the uh, outer side of the knee, so people with a lateral collateral ligament problem or a posterolateral corner problem who actually have constitutional varus alignment as well. So as they stand on the leg, the knee opens up more on the lateral side. And then a valgus thrust, obviously the other way around for people who have problems uh, either with collapse on the 
lateral side of the joint or ligament laxities on the medial side of the joint. Second gate I thought would be worth highlighting or gait abnormality is the quads avoidance gait and this is seen in people uh, who have weakness or paralysis of the quadriceps muscle of the extensor mechanism um, so that when they put their weight on the leg they lock it out backwards uh, as they're unable to take their weight on a flexed knee and again we'll try and get John just to demonstrate that so it's really just pushing the knee backwards as they put their weight on it typically seen in people with things like polio okay um, of course, the most common gait abnormality would be a straightforward antalgic gait. So uh, we'll get you to demonstrate that, John. So the simple limp and people who have less time in stance phase because the limb is painful. And the final thing that would be worth highlighting is people who walk with a stiff knee. They tend uh, to have some degree of fixed flexion in the knee. So they really move the knee uh, very little during the gait cycle. So we'll get you just to demonstrate that as well, John. Okay, and once more coming back. So it's really just holding the knee stiff as they, uh, as they go through the gait cycle. The various other abnormalities such as uh, foot drop, high stepping gait seen in a foot drop, but I think those are going to be demonstrated in, uh, in other sections. So the next thing I thought would be worth looking at is just to concentrate on a couple of the other special tests. So John, I'm going to get you to jump up on the couch here. Um, we're going to just consider collateral ligament uh, examination. Uh, in a, just a little bit more detail. I know that was demonstrated in the first part of the video. Um, a couple of things just to highlight. Um, there's different ways of doing it. Uh, some of the textbooks talk about holding the leg up in the air here, putting your fingers on either side of the joint and stressing the joint. Now I find that slightly clumsy uh, way of doing it and the problem is patients always try to be helpful and they'll actually hold the leg up and support the leg and that rather negates some of the aspects of the test. So my preferred way of doing it is actually to leave the leg lying on the examination couch. Um, we can then quite easily flex the knee to 20 to 30 degrees and with the weight of the leg supported on the couch I can now stress the medial collateral ligament obviously checking with the patient that it's not hurting them and then I can put my fingers underneath here and stress the lateral compartment feeling for any instabilities. It's very important to stress the ligaments in hyperextension so I'm going to let the leg go down full, fully straight so for the medial side I'm going to hyperextend the knee and in that position the medial collateral ligament is absolutely solid um, because the posterior capsule becomes tight so the medial side of the joint doesn't open at all. I then put, it to, put the knee in full extension, stress it again where we can see just a very small amount of opening and now flex to 20-30 degrees and stress it again where we see even more opening. So that's really just testing the posterior capsule, the posterior oblique ligament and the medial collateral ligament in those three positions. And the same thing on the lateral side of the knee. The other aspect of uh, collateral ligament uh, examination which is just useful to highlight is in patients who've had an acutely injured knee when the knee is extremely painful. And a nice way of doing that is to examine the patient just on the side of the bed. So I'm just going to get you to move over slightly to the side here. And that way you can leave the thigh supported on the examination couch and just take the leg over the side of the bed, um, supporting the femur, and stressing the medial collateral ligament, putting hand over the top and stressing the lateral collateral ligament, uh, again checking with the patient to make sure it's not too painful. So that's a good way of examining the uh, acutely injured knee um, uh, when it's painful for the patient. Okay, final thing I just wanted to talk about now uh, on the collateral ligament examination is uh, assessment of the posterolateral corner. Okay. In some patients who have uh, a lateral collateral ligament injury, there will also be an injury to the um, popliteofibular ligament and the posterolateral joint capsule. And this gives a rotational instability of the knee, which, is, uh, or which can be assessed in several ways. Now, the first way to do it was the patient lying prone. So I'm just going to put the couch down here, get you to lie on your front. Um, We'll imagine that this is the injured knee for ease of uh, viewing on camera. Uh, we keep the knees together. We bend the knees up initially to 90 degrees and looking at the amount of rotation uh, as judged, as marked by the feet, we can rotate the legs and we're looking here for symmetrical rotation uh, uh, of the tibia at the knee. 
an abnormal result is said to be, or an abnormal test is said to be, an increase in 15 degrees of rotation. We then take the legs down to 30 degrees of flexion and we repeat the test. So rotating, I'll stand out of the way here so we can see at the end, rotating the legs and we, again we're looking for an abnormality or an increase in rotation of 15 degrees. So if I sort of mimic that, we would end up with a situation like this. So when we do it, it only goes to there, whereas the abnormal leg rotates more. Okay. Now, if it's an isolated posterolateral lateral corner injury, then this positive test is only seen at uh, 15 to 30 degrees of knee flexion. If there's an additional posterior cruciate ligament injury, the abnormal rotation is also seen uh, when the knee is flexed up to 90 degrees. Next thing we're going to do, get you to sit with your legs hanging down over the side of the bed, please. Um, over the side here, I'm going to bring a chair around and in this flexed position, again we can test an increase in rotation. Uh, I'll show it on this leg just so I'm not in the way of the camera. But if we just feel where the fibular head is here and where the tibial tuberosity is here, I can take the foot and rotate the leg and I'm looking here for an increase in rotation of the tibia. We'll just let that relax again. Okay, so I'm looking for increase in rotation and I'm comparing that to the other knee. Again, finger on fibular head, thumb on the tibial tuberosity and using my other hand to rotate the foot. So we're looking for the degree of rotation in the leg here. Okay, for this part of the video, what we wanted to do is focus a little bit more on anterior cruciate ligament and posterior cruciate ligament uh, tests. And Mrs. Tibbetts here has very kindly come along uh, because she's got a problem with her anterior cruciate ligament in her left knee. So I'm just going to go around to the other side and we're going to focus on that. So the first thing to do uh, when assessing the anterior cruciate ligament is just to make sure that there's not a posterior cruciate ligament problem. So again, as seen on the first half of the video, we're going to bend both knees up to 90 degrees. And the idea is to look from the side and we're looking for this sign called the posterior sag sign. And that is where the tibia is sagging backwards because the posterior cruciate ligament is damaged and it's not holding the tibia in its normal, um, normal position. So I'm comparing both knees um, from one to the other. Um, I can um, run a straight ruler or a uh, pen up the front of the knee here looking for this posterior sag sign. And the next thing to do is sit next to the, uh, next to the leg and run my thumbs up the front of the tibial condyles and I can feel here this is the top of the tibia and it steps backwards onto the femoral condyles and this is called the step off sign and we should feel the tibial condyles more prominent so that it steps backwards or steps off onto the femoral condyles and I'm comparing that to the to the other knee okay um, I can now put uh, this leg down uh, and in Mrs. Tibbetts that's completely normal. So I'm next going to check for the anterior draw sign. So I'm going to use my elbow just to gently support the foot. I'm checking that the hamstring muscles are relaxed so that your leg's nice and relaxed and I'm now pulling the tibia forwards. Okay, again making sure the hamstrings are relaxed and I'm pulling forwards and this is the anterior draw sign. Now it's not the best test for an anterior cruciate ligament problem because the hamstring muscles tend to tighten and hold the tibia backwards. If there was a posterior cruciate ligament injury, you would see an increased amount of forward movement. Um, but really what you're then doing is correcting the posterior sag so that you're bringing the tibia forwards back to its neutral position. Um, and actually this represents an, an abnormal posterior cruciate ligament examination or posterior cruciate ligament rupture. So, that's the importance of feeling for the tibiofemoral step-off. Okay, if the tibiofemoral step-off is normal and the tibia pulls forwards too far, that represents an anterior cruciate ligament injury. Now the most sensitive test for the anterior cruciate ligament is actually the Lachman test. And we do this in a position of the knee about 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. I'm supporting the femur with my right hand and I'm taking the tibia and just gently pulling forwards and we can see here that there's a large amount of anterior movement of the tibia and if I lean across and compare that to the other knee we'll let that relax here I would normally of course do the examination from the other side of the bed but just for the purposes of the video here we can see that there's hardly any movement 
And if I show you that again on this side, nice and floppy there, you okay? Yeah. We can see that there's an increased amount of movement. So this represents a positive Lachman test. The test that shows the rotational instability in the knee after an anterior cruciate ligament is the pivot shift test. And this uh, takes a little bit of practice um, and it's difficult to do if the knee is uncomfortable. So always check with the patients that, uh, that, that the knee is comfortable and it's not hurting them. So what I'm going to do is lift the leg up. We're going to let your leg go nice and floppy. I'm going to take the weight of the leg under my arm. <clears throat> we start with the leg in a position of full extension. I'm now going to gently internally rotate the tibia. Now if the ACL is ruptured, that allows the tibial condyle to sublux forwards in front of the lateral femoral condyle. And as I bend the knee, it clunks back into position. And we're just going to drop back down again. And we can just see that gently clunk and jump back forwards. And does that reproduce your feeling of the knee giving way? So that's the positive um, uh, question that you ask the patient to see if that is their feeling of instability in the knee. So those are the tests for the anterior cruciate ligament. Um, going back now a stage to the posterior cruciate ligament, um, if we bend the knee up, <coughs> the Posterior draw test again is performed with the knee at 90 degrees of flexion. Try to avoid sitting on the patient's foot because otherwise they tend to pull it out of the way, activating the hamstring muscles and again um, negating the test. But I'm going to sit next to the foot, so I'm going to lodge the foot next to me. <clears throat> I'm feeling for the tibiofemoral step off. I can feel that the knee's in a neutral position now and I'm pushing backwards and that's absolutely solid and that's the normal situation uh, if the posterior cruciate ligament's intact. There are a couple of other tests for the posterior cruciate ligament that are worth knowing and one of those is the quadriceps active test. Now in this test you let the leg lie <coughs> over your forearm and you ask the patient to just gently lift your heel off the bed okay, and relax back again. Now, if the posterior cruciate ligament is ruptured and the tibia is sagging backwards, as the patient contracts the quadriceps muscle, you see the tibia slide forwards back into its neutral position. So again, I'm just going to get you to lift your foot off the bed and back down again. So that's called the quadriceps active test. Telephemoral joint problems are very common and I think it's worth focusing specifically on the examination of a patient with patellofemoral instability. So there's a few things to look at really from start to finish during the examination. First thing to note is uh, the standing alignment of the patient both in the coronal and the rotational plane. So um, the, the usual abnormality is that patients will have an increase in valgus alignment of their knee as this increases the cue angle and therefore predisposes to patellar instability or maltracking. The other thing that's worth looking for is the so-called miserable malalignment or the squinting patelli. So uh, you need to just crouch down in front of the patients and just feel the direction of the patelli. And with people with torsional malalignment of the uh, lower limbs, the patelli may be squinting, actually almost well, facing in towards each other. Um, and then you need to compare the foot progression angle as well. So that's the so-called miserable malalignment. The best way of testing the rotational profile is then with the patient prone. So I'm going to get you to uh, lie face down. And we're really looking for the uh, uh, femoral neck antiversion angle. So with the leg bent up to here, um, we can do both together. We're looking for how much um, external rotation there is, comparing both legs, and then how much internal rotation there is Okay, and in patients with uh, increased femoral neck antiversion, you see a much greater degree of internal rotation at the hip. Now get you to sit up, so you're sitting normally on the couch, and bend your knees up. We can then assess the uh, tibial torsion by flexing the knee to 90 degrees and palpating the position of the medial and lateral malleoli at the ankle. Uh, and looking for increased internal or external tibial torsion. I'm going to let you drop the legs down now. So having looked at the rotational and coronal plane alignment, focus a little bit more on the knee, looking for wasting in the quadriceps muscles. Uh, we're looking for 
an effusion within the knee which might follow an acute injury or some uh, degenerative changes in the knee. Um, we can look at the Q angle uh, which as you know is the angle that the quadriceps muscle makes so it's taken from the anterior superior iliac spine down to the center of the patella and then down to the tibial tuberosity okay um, and if people have a laterally placed tibial tuberosity or increase in valgus alignment then they'll have an increased Q angle and therefore a predisposition to patellar instability. The uh, state of the soft tissues can be assessed again in this position um, just let your leg go nice and relaxed here by feeling the extent to which you can glide the patella medially and laterally so with the leg fully relaxed at 20 to 30 degrees of flexion the patella is now sitting in the trochlear groove I can push it medially and it moves just one quadrant if we imagine the patella is divided into longitudinal quadrants we can push it just one quadrant that way checking that's not too uncomfortable and we're trying to push it laterally and again it'll only move one quadrant laterally so the normal uh, glide would be one quadrant laterally and one to two quadrants medially in patients with uh, recurrent lateral patella uh, instability the medial soft tissues the medial retinaculum or medial patellofemoral ligament component of it is ruptured and it's very easy to glide the patella um, sometimes completely to dislocation laterally the real key to patella femoral uh, examination now is to look at the tracking. I'm going to get you to sit with your legs over the side of the bed. Um, and we're going to ask you to fully extend your leg. I'm going to hold on to the patella so I can mark its course and just gently uh, flex again. A little bit quicker than that. We're going to go up, up and down. And we can see here there's normal central tracking. So normal tracking would be completely straight or a very slight lateral movement. In patients who have patellar instability, you sometimes see this inverted J tracking as it comes straight and it falls off the side here. In patients with tro severe trochlear dysplasia, when they have a domed rather than a, uh, a domed trochlear rather than a groove in the trochlea, you see extremely uh, severe lateral tracking uh, such that the patella literally falls off the side of the femur uh, as they fully extend the knee. We can also get the patient to do that whilst palpating for crepitus and after uh, years of patellar instability the joint becomes damaged, uh, articular cartilage degenerate and you feel significant crepitus in the knee. We'll bend you up and down here and you should note at what position of flexion you feel the crepitus and that can be accentuated by uh, resisted knee extension. So push up against me there, okay and down again and push up again here as hard as you can. Very good. When it comes to assessing patients for meniscal tears, um, actually I find the most useful uh, sign is specific joint line tenderness. And John, if we get you to sit back up on here. So for medial meniscal tears, with the knee bent up to 90 degrees, then the classic place for the tenderness is actually more posteromedial joint line. So it's really feeling specifically along the joint line one finger or thumb as you go around and actually getting onto that posterior medial joint line so that's the classic place uh, where someone's tender with a medial meniscal tear and we bend the knee up to here for the lateral side the tenderness slightly different it's usually on the mid portion uh, of the lateral joint line there are of course a couple of other tests described for meniscal tears McMurray's test is the classic one it was really described um, well, it's a provocation test uh, which was described um, in patients with an unstable bucket handle tear and what McMurray actually described uh, was the knee being flexed right up uh, so for the medial meniscus knee in almost full flexion externally rotating the tibia so that the medial plateau is brought forwards putting the leg uh, into a position that loads the medial compartment so a varus strain to the knee and then extending the knee and it's an unpleasant test because it's meant to provoke um, locking of, a, of an unstable medial meniscal tear and on the lateral side um, it's sort of the reverse really so starting in flexion again internally rotating the tibia this time um, feeling along the lateral joint line with your fingers putting the leg into valgus alignment to load the lateral compartment and now extending the knee. 
So that was what McMurray described uh, or described. A couple of other tests, there's um, uh, Apley's grind test, which uh, is classically done with the patient lying face down again. So we'll just get you to flip over again, John. Um, so with the knee bent up to 90 degrees, it's really a case of loading the knee and rotating the tibia. And again, an unpleasant prov provocation test trying to trap the, uh, the, the medial meniscus. That can be adapted if we sit you back again. That can be adapted. So with the leg up to this sort of position, just feeling along the joint line and just rotating the tibia and just seeing if that provokes the patient's uh, medial or lateral joint pain. Of course, it's not uh, a, a highly sensitive test and it may be positive in patients who simply have some degenerative changes in the medial compartment. There are many other aspects of um, knee surgery uh, or knee injury to, to focus on. A couple of other things that are useful to know. Um, patients in, with uh, patella tendinopathy, it's worth knowing exactly where they're tender and it's just here at the inferior pole of the patella and it's, uh, it's classic that the pain is more obvious, the tenderness is more obvious with the knee fully extended. So I'm now just tilting the patella up a little bit and I'm just palpating just here, inferior pole of the patella. It's a slightly sensitive area anyway, uh, but in patients with patella tendinopathy, it's extremely tender. And if we flex the knee up to 90 degrees and palpate in the same area, uh, it usually guards the tenderness to some degree and they're less tender in that point. Patients with iliotibial band friction syndrome um, or so-called runner's knee will be tender exactly over the uh, lateral epicondyle where the ITB flicks backwards and forwards when they run. And the final thing I thought would be worth just mentioning uh, is patients with uh, impinging plyche in the knee uh, looking for where they're tender. And really it's just tenderness. The most common one would be a medial plica and it's really tenderness just along the medial border of the patella here where that plica just gets caught between the medial facet of the patella and medial side of the trochlea. Occasionally you feel a um, tenderness from a, uh, a lateral plica or supralateral plica just as it gets trapped or caught just here, uh, really level with the superior border of the patella. We've not covered absolutely everything, but I hope that's been a useful run through of some of the uh, finer points of knee examination. Thanks very much.